Now, the calls for a focus on behavioral change has soared because several people continue to defy the wearing of face masks despite consistent messages on its importance for people to stay away or to stay safe from contracting coronavirus. President Akufado has had to move from persuasion to force. On Sunday, he directed that wearing of masks should be mandatory, a directive which is to be followed by an executive instrument making it an offense not to wear the mask. Well, it has been about 48 hours since that announcement and the message should be fresh in our minds. But a drive through the central business district alone is all it takes to prove that people are not budging. PSC Nanaya Safo has been out and about. Here is what he found. <laughs> The novel coronavirus may be a recent canker, but the trait of indiscipline is not and continues to stifle the state's efforts in fighting the pandemic. Ghana now has more than 11,000 confirmed positive cases, with about 50 more dead in the country. Joy News is in the central business district of Accra to check how seriously the threat of this virus is taken and what people are doing in terms of discipline, wearing their face mask and following other directives given by states. So Pamela is a trader here, as you heard uh, her explain. She says that most of them have not heard or seen of this coronavirus itself, but they believe in its existence and as such, they are taking all measures possible to keep safe within this period. She also says uh, most of her customers demand that she must have her nose mask on at all times. And for that reason, she also has hers in place. We move on to the next lady here. Oh, Obi Ba, yeah, you Max, Obi. <laughs> so that is Regina. Regina says she has been into sales of cassava here for quite some time. She says once in a while uh, she brings the, down her nose mask just for comfort and ease. And I asked her uh, whether she wasn't afraid of the risk associated with this. She said by God's grace everything was going to be fine and that she was not going to die in any way. Oh, I'm a bad I'm a Oh, <laughs> She says she does not get so close to customers anymore and that she maintains the highest social distancing in that they usually stand here and she stands there far apart. That she doesn't put her nose mask over her nose because uh, she said it's very important. I don't know she has. Oh, Miss Shafana, Miss Fatim and Yaman. Hey, <laughs> 
Market no good. I know sell them. You see, I'm my own. So you don't have five cities on you to buy those masks? I know it once, once they no get. PC Namayo Safu, who was out and about there, joining me on Skype is Dr. Felix, uh, Felix Dako Jeke. She's a health communication expert and also a senior lecturer and head of departments of social and behavioral. Uh, sciences. Doc, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Good afternoon, my dear. Okay, Thanks so the general conversation, me. right, the general conversation is to understand how we can get behavioral change out of Ghanaians as far as this is concerned, and because this is a public health issue, um, we have struggled with sanitation, etc. But this is a public health issue, so essentially you will expect that people are concerned about their health, but it doesn't look like that. There are three different categories of people I see here. Those who appreciate the disease exists, but are not wearing it anyway. Those who are wearing it, but wearing it wrongly. And those who are in denial. Take them one after the other for me. These three people, how do we get Ghanaians to understand that there is a real threat out there? Sticking to these three categories of people. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so you are drawing attention to these three categories of people. We have the first, those who are not wearing at all. Mm. And then we have those who are wearing but not wearing it very well. Yeah. And those who do not even believe uh, that there is any kind of disease that would actually require that they wear. Just to do a little bit of linkages, yeah, your reporter was also making mention of a few things that I want to draw attention to. Okay. Uh, he, he mentioned the fact that out there, there are people who have heard right, about coronavirus disease. And there are those who do not believe uh, about its existence. A number of things that we draw uh, from on this, right? So when we want a behavioral change uh, and we are using communication as a tool, there are concepts or there are things that are relevant here. So the first one is what we call awareness, right? So when you want to measure awareness or you want to know who is aware of a particular phenomenon, in this case, which is COVID-19, then all you are interested in is who has heard of this. So uh, in communication, in sending out messages, who has heard about COVID-19? That is one. And the next level would be knowledge. So knowledge would be those who have heard, but actually have specific understanding of how the disease works, and also specific understanding of all the precautionary measures that are supposed to be taking to prevent contracting the disease and also all the means of transmission. So it is not just awareness, but once you move to knowledge, you build other things into awareness. That is having the relevant knowledge that will lead you to do what is expected of you. The, th the third arm, so we, we have awareness, then we have knowledge. The third arm is actually the practice. That is what we want. So people have heard or have heard about the disease they have specific knowledge or relevant knowledge about the disease in terms of transmission, prevention, and all that. But the third one is the practice. Are they actually practicing what they are expected of them? Usually in health communication, what you realize is that there is a pyramid that we can build out of these three um, dimensions. So awareness, usually you have a lot of people who are aware of the disease, they've heard of it. And when you come to knowledge, there is a gap. You don't have the same number of people who have heard of the disease translating it into knowledge. And even when you get to practice, it becomes much more smaller, uh, the number of people who are practicing it, which means that at each level, as we are going higher of this hierarchy, we drop out. 
So we are sending out lots of information that COVID-19 is there. However, we are not actually impacting people with the relevant knowledge that they are supposed to have. And in between knowledge and practice is what we call the self-efficacy and creating an enabling environment so that people can actually practice. There is also a gap. So even those who have the knowledge, they also still have a gap in there in trying to practice it. So from here, that we, just like you are asking me, those who are not wearing the nose mask, yes, they have heard that there is a disease, but do they really understand the transmission, modes of transmission? Do they really understand ways in which they are supposed to act so that, it, uh, that they will prevent uh, themselves from actually contracting the disease? And if they do, do they have the means, do they have the enabling environment to practice uh, these precautionary measures that are being uh, spelled out by the government, the Ghana Health Service and all other state authorities? So with this background that you have given us, if you were to advise on how to get put this together in a communication material or in a communication campaign that works, where do we start from? All right, so thank you for the question. So where do we start from? Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit of background. So in March, when we started recording the first few cases, we know that the president came to us to actually tell us um, that we have recorded cases and citizenry we were supposed to do A, B, and C. What we realized at that time was that the information flow was very, very top-down. So we would all be sitting behind our television sets or behind radio sets and listening to the president to, uh, speaking to us about uh, COVID-19. Beyond that, there was no way of understanding what was going on. However, March, April, May, we are in June, we are being expected to build other communication channels. And these communication channels are supposed to be channels that are relevant at the community level. So we are no longer expected to be using the top-down uh, messages anymore. However, we are supposed to go into the communities and, to, and do a number of things. The first one is to identify relevant communication channels that people trust within their communities. So when you use those channels, it could be anything. Now we are not supposed to come together. However, we know that there are communities that do, for instance, the gongo beating uh, and send messages through that. Can we use that? That is one, identifying the relevant communication channels. The other one is using trusted people within the communities. So there are opinion leaders within the communities. Uh, there are NGOs who are already working within the communities who are very much trusted uh, by these communities that when they tell you that your life is uh, threatened by uh, COVID-19, your, 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 the possibility of you contracting the disease, people will sit up and listen to them. And you know that uh, once these opinion leaders start talking to us, because they have an eye on us, they are very much close to us, people are, feel uh, enabled and also feel compelled uh, to adapt some of these things. So there are two things that we can like, do now identify relevant channels at the community levels mm -hmm. and also use uh, opinion leaders or trusted people at this level. And at the heart of all of this is community engagement. We need to engage the communities rather than just sending out messages and just hope that it will drop somewhere and somebody will pick the information and act on it. We are supposed to consciously work with communities, engage them, understand what the challenges are. Why are you not wearing the mask? What are the challenges? What is your perspective? And then we work with them for an outcome that will lead to a reduction in the cases that we keep reporting. I hope that we get there. And I indicated in my intro today that President Okufado seems to have moved from persuasion. And I remember the early days when he addressed uh, the, 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 this, this, the country. He'd say he's urging people to do one of the, it looks like he's moved from persuasion to force. So he talks about an executive instrument that will back mandatory wearing of masks. This is a public health situation. People have to take care of themselves and to protect themselves, uh, protect themselves from themselves, protect themselves from other people as well. Will force work in such instances? Thank you very much. So uh, there, there are a number of theories or uh, models or frameworks that can be used if you want to persuade people for them to engage in a particular uh, attitude or practice that you are interested in. 
So engaging them is one thing that is one of the things that I mentioned, which means that you understand that they also have a position, a position in this, and you want to reason with them more. That is one angle. And the other angle is applying force. There are several countries, and it's not just Ghana, there are several countries out there that for specific um, kind of behaviors, they would apply force, which has worked very well. You go to Rwanda and other places when they talk about sanitation, it's about force, because if you don't comply, the police is out there to catch you, right? So force is one, and also we can sometimes also use fear appeal, right? So you appeal to people's senses by letting them know the threats that are associated or the risk and exposures that are associated with um, coronavirus disease when you want to persuade them. There are different angles that you want to use. My only caution is that you want to use an angle that it will be easy for you to enforce and push for. I ask myself that if we are going for uh, force, which means that if I don't have the nose mask on, a police is so going to arrest me. Is the police safe? Mm. And am I safe in the process? Would it be better for us to continue to let people understand where they are and what they are supposed to do. And I also tell myself that I think we are beating ourselves too hard, right? I ask myself, when did we start talking about coronavirus disease? We started talking about coronavirus disease in March, and we are in June, and we are expecting every individual in Ghana to have changed their behavior. That is not realistic, absolutely not realistic. We, we ask or we are watching television, we are listening to the news um, and have access to different kinds of information wherever we are. But the intersection between communication and public health is not being emphasized a lot. So, you, for instance, uh, different kinds of information that uh, the media houses would have given out to us. Yes, they would be giving out information. We might take it and use it if we please. However, whenever there is an intersection between communication and public health, it means that there should be specific approaches that will be used for specific outcomes. And the outcome here is behavior change. So we are not just giving information out there, but we are also trying to assess how the information is being received and can we modify the way the information is going out there. I think that we all have a role to play here not just governments, not just the individual, the media houses, we also have a role. We need to rethink how we give the information out uh, mm. to our viewers and also to our listeners. Talking about rethinking the mode through which we communicate this uh, issue, is fear an effective tool? That's an interesting question. So we've done a lot of research um, when HIV and AIDS started. Some of us were very much interested in HIV and AIDS. And personally, I took to studying the communication um, tools that were being used to communicate about HIV and AIDS. So this is in the early 2000s um, and also the late 90s. Uh, I had the opportunity to actually assess um, images and also uh, jingles that were out there that was pushing HIV and AIDS as a threat. What we realized down the line was that the fear appeal may have worked initially to put fear into people for them to change their behaviors. However, the disadvantage of that is that we create the stigma and the discrimination. Mm. So unfortunately, people, we were thinking, you are thinking that people should be afraid of the disease. However, they, are, they, they transfer that fear from the disease to the person mm. who contracts the disease, which is very unfortunate. And we have realized over the years that communities and societies have not been able to manage that very well. So you push so much fear into people that when you mention the disease that anybody who unfortunately had contracted the disease becomes the victim and everybody is running away from them. So fear, I would cringe a little bit away from that I believe that if we take the route of using science, communication, and empowering communities to lead this fight, we would go far rather than putting fear into them. Hmm. That's the second time uh, we've heard today, right here on the show, the need for the science to be applied uh, in sending this message across. Doc, I'll say a very big thanks to you. Thank you so much. I'm sure that as the days go ahead, we'll have to... Uh, 
come back to you so we have more of this conversation in the hope that it will it will educate people and it will bring people that behavioral change that we all require. Dr. Phyllis uh, Dakon Jeke is a health communication expert and a senior lecturer, also head of Department Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Ghana. So fear, false persuasion, appeal, science, what do we go for and how effective will they be?